Welcome to chapter 7. This chapter is titled, What is Argument? from our Beyond Feelings book. So we're talking about our critical thinking textbook today. So basically, um, when people have opinions, um, hopefully informed opinions supported by evidence, like we talked about in the last couple chapters, um, sometimes they will use that to create what is called an argument. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to break down exactly what an argument is into its different components um, and define those those pieces and then we will talk about how to analyze arguments in terms of their quality and validity, how to interpret them, uh, what parts of an argument to pay attention to, what parts to dismiss, um, and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started by just defining what an argument is. Crash Course Philosophy is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace, share your passion with the world. Aristotle once described humans as the rational animal. Well, actually, he said that man is the rational animal, but we don't have to be sexist just because he was. And if you've ever gotten into an argument with someone about religion or politics or which Hemsworth is the hottest, then you've experienced how irrational people can be about their opinions. But what Aristotle meant is that rationality is our distinguishing characteristic. It's what sets us apart from the beasts. And no matter how much you disagree with someone about God or Obama or Chris Hemsworth, you can at least grant that they are not beasts. Because, most of the time at least, people can be persuaded by arguments. You use arguments all the time, in the comments, at family dinners, with your friends. You probably just don't think of them the same way that philosophers do. When you try and convince your parents to loan you the car, or when you're talking up Crash Course to your friends, you are using arguments. Thanks, by the way. Each time you tell someone to do or believe something, or when you're explaining why you do or believe something, you are giving an argument. The problem is, the vast majority of people aren't really good at arguments. We tend to confuse making a good argument with, like, having witty comebacks, or just making your points more loudly and angrily, instead of building a case on a solid foundation of logic, which can be harder than it sounds. But learning about arguments and strong reasoning will not only make you a better philosopher, it will also set you up to be a more persuasive person, someone who people will listen to. Someone who's convincing. So yeah, these skills are beneficial no matter what you want to do with your life, so you might as well know how to argue properly. If you want to learn how to argue, then you should probably start around 2400 years ago when Plato was laying out how reason can and should function in the human mind. He believed that we all have what he called a tripartite soul, what you might think of as yourself or your psyche divided into three parts. First, there's the rational or logical part of the soul, which represents cool reason. This is the aspect of yourself that seeks the truth and is swayed by facts and arguments. When you decide to stop eating bacon for two meals a day because as delicious as it is, it's bad for you, then you make that decision with the guidance of the rational part of your soul. But then there's the spirited aspect, often described as the emotional part of the self, although that doesn't really quite capture it. The spirited soul isn't just about feeling, it's also about how your feelings fuel your actions. It's the part that responds in righteous anger at injustice, the part that drives your ambition and calls upon you to protect others. It gives you a sense of honor and duty and is swayed by sympathy. So if you decide to stop eating bacon because you just finished reading Charlotte's Web, then now you're in love with Wilbur, then you're being guided by the spirited part of your soul. But we share the next part of our soul with other animals, be they pig or moose or aardvark. The appetitive part is what drives you to eat, have sex, and protect yourself from danger. It is swayed by temptations that are carnal and visceral. So at those times when you go ahead and just eat all the bacon because it just smells so dang good, the appetitive aspect of your soul is in control. Now, Plato believed that the best human beings, and I should point out here that Plato most definitely did believe that some people were were better than others, are always ruled by the rational part of their soul because it works to keep the spirited and the appetitive parts in check. People who allow themselves to be ruled by their spirited or appetitive selves are base, he believed, and not fully, properly human. Now, most of us don't buy into the concept of the tripartite soul anymore, or the idea that some humans are less human than others, but we do understand that we're all motivated by physical desires, emotional impulses, and rational arguments. And philosophers continue to agree with Plato that reason should be in the driver's 
accuracy. So how do you know if you're good at it? How can you test your reasoning? Well, let's head over to the Thought Bubble for some Flash philosophy. Throughout this course, we're going to apply our philosophical skills by pondering puzzles, paradoxes, and thought experiments. Because remember, philosophers love thinking about questions, especially ones that don't have ready answers. So think of these exercises as philosophical wind sprints, quick tests of your mental abilities. And here's a doozy from 20th century British thinker Bertrand Russell, one of the pioneers of what's known as analytic philosophy. Say there's a town in which all men are required by law to be clean-shaven. This town has only one barber, a man who must follow strict rules. Rule number one, he must shave all men who do not shave themselves. Rule number two, he must not shave any man who does shave himself. It's the nightmare of every libertarian and every mustachioed hipster, but here's the question. Does the barber shave himself. Because think about it, the barber only shaves men who don't shave themselves, so if he does shave himself, then he must not, because the barber's not allowed to shave guys who shave themselves. But if he doesn't shave himself, then he has to be shaved by the barber, because that's the law. Russell came up with this puzzle to illustrate the fact that a group must always be a member of itself. That means, in this case, that all men who shave themselves has to include every guy who shaves himself, including the barber. Otherwise, the logic that dictates the group's existence just doesn't hold up. And if the barber is a logical impossibility, then he can't exist, which means the reasoning behind his existence is inherently flawed. And philosophy doesn't tolerate flawed reasoning. So how do we make sure that we're ruled by good, sound, not flawed reason? By perfecting the art of the argument. An argument in philosophy isn't just a shouting match. Instead, philosophers maintain that your beliefs should always be backed up by reasons, which we call premises. Premises form the structure of your argument. They offer evidence for your belief, and you can have as many premises as you like as long as they support your conclusion, which is the thing that you actually believe. So let's dissect the anatomy of an argument. There are actually several different species of arguments. Probably the most familiar and the easiest to carry out is the deductive argument. The main rule of a deductive argument is, if your premises are true, then your conclusion must be true. And knowing that something is actually true is very rare and Awesome. So here's a boiled down version of a good deductive argument. Premise one, all humans are mortal. Premise two, Socrates is human. Conclusion, Socrates is mortal. This kind of reasoning, where one fact leads to another, is called entailment. Once we know that all humans are mortal, and that Socrates is human, those facts entail that Socrates is mortal. Deduction begins with the general, in this case what we know about human mortality, and reasons down to the specific, Socrates in particular. What's great about deductive arguments is that the truth of the premises must lead to the truth of the conclusion. When this happens, we say that the argument is valid. There's no way for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. Now check out this argument. All humans are mortal, Socrates is a human, therefore Socrates was Plato's teacher. That argument is invalid because nothing about human mortality can prove that Socrates was Plato's teacher. As you might have noticed, there are plenty of mortal humans who never taught Plato. What's interesting though is that this argument does happen to have a true conclusion, which leads us to another issue, and that is validity is not the same as truth. All valid really means is that if the premises are true, then your conclusion can't be false. But that doesn't mean that your premises prove your conclusion to be correct. Like in the case of whether Socrates was Plato's teacher, the premises are true and the conclusion is true, but the argument is still not valid because the premises don't in any way prove the conclusion. It just happens to be true. So if your premises don't guarantee the truth of your conclusion, then you can end up with some really crappy arguments, like this one. All cats are mammals. I'm a mammal, therefore I'm a cat. As much as part of me would like to be my cat, this is invalid because the conclusion doesn't entail from the premises at all. I mean, all cats are mammals, but all mammals aren't cats, which means there are such things as non-cat mammals, which I am just one example of. And it probably goes without saying, but you can have a perfectly valid argument and still have a false conclusion if any of your premises are false. For example, all humans have tails, my brother John is a human, therefore John Green has a tail. The argument is totally valid because the premises entail the conclusion. The reasoning totally stands up. It's just that one of the premises is flawed. Since I'm reasonably certain that John doesn't have a tail, I've seen him in a bathing suit, this argument is not deductively sound. And a deductively sound argument is one that's free of formal flaws or defects. It's an argument whose premises are all true, and that's valid, which means its conclusion is guaranteed to be true. So, sound arguments should always be your goal. The reason that deduction is prized by philosophers and lots of other important kinds of thinkers is that it's the only kind
kind of argument that can give you a real certainty. But it's limited, because it only works if you're starting with known true premises, which are hard to come by. And for what it's worth, deductive truths are usually pretty obvious. They don't tend to lead us to startling new information, like the fact that I'm not a cat or that John doesn't have a tail. So instead of starting with premises that are already certain, like deduction does, you're gonna have to know how to determine the truth of and your confidence in your premises. Which means you're gonna have to acquaint yourself with the other species of arguments, which we're gonna do next time. But today we talked about the value of reason, the structure of arguments, and we took a close look at one kind of argument, deductive reasoning. This episode of Crash Course Philosophy is made possible by Squarespace. Squarespace is a way to create a website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features a user-friendly interface, custom templates, and 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash crash course for a special offer. Crash Course Philosophy is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. You can head over to their channel to check out amazing shows like The Art Assignment, The Chatterbox, and Blank on Blank. This episode of Crash Course was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio with the help of all of these amazing people, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. Uh, the word argument has several different meanings and can kind of take different shapes. So the first type of argument that we're going to talk about is a quarrel, which is generally defined as a heated, emotional, screaming match that often ends up in meaningless babble. And it's not really relevant to critical thinking. So for our purposes, this is not how we are going to define an argument. Another type of argument is a formal debate. And this is defined as the exchange of opinions between two or more people. Ideally, in a formal debate, egos are put aside, and the goal is to find a deeper understanding of the issue. And then, kind of ideologically speaking, there's really no winner or loser because the idea is that we should all be enlightened from a formal debate. So, to that extent, we are all winners. Um, but this is really not very practical. It's hard for people to put their egos aside, as you know. So, we all want to win, and we all want to keep score, even in these formal debates. But... In theory, we should try to view debating this way with the end goal being that we all kind of gain some knowledge and some information through this back and forth of uh, exchanging ideas. And then the third type of argument is the line of reasoning that supports a judgment. And so in this type of argument, we focus on the quality of the individual comp uh, contribution to the overall deliberation. And this is the type of argument that we want to focus on in this class. So it doesn't uh, necessarily involve yelling or name calling or kind of any of those things that are generally associated with an argument. But instead, it's just a back and forth exchange of ideas. Um, and we look at the individual ideas from one person and we kind of break down their line of reasoning to see if it makes sense, to see if the conclusion that they draw from that line of reasoning is rational, is logical, um, is valid. And so that's what we're trying to do with um, arguments in this class. Okay, so let's watch a video now on exactly what an argument is and then the different um, bits of terminology that you'll need to know for the exam in terms of being able to kind of break down the component pieces of an argument. Welcome to PH Times, the show about philosophy, life, and everything in between. Today we're going to be explaining exactly what is an argument, the core instrument in philosophy and widely misrepresented term. Before going into what actually an argument is though, it's necessary to talk about what it isn't. The commonly held view of an argument is something like this. Two people clashing that frequently involves yelling or something of the sort. The word argument is viewed as being synonymous with words like fight, quarrel, dispute, and squabble. These arguments are almost always over a disagreement, are normally heated and confrontational, and more often than not involve anger. In the world of philosophy though, just as in the world of science, this isn't what we mean when we say argument. An argument isn't even something that two people have, it's something one person has and presents. In the academic world, an argument works like this. You have a premise or premises, which are facts or claims being made about something, and a conclusion, which is what the premises are trying to prove. The quality or strength of your argument is determined by two factors. The first factor is the strength of your premises. This is determined by if your claims are true, which means if they line up with reality or not, 
and if they cover all the bases that need to be covered for your argument. In other words, if your premises are true, but they don't account for everything they should, you could still end up having a weak argument. Conversely, if the premises aren't true, but are extensive in what they cover, your argument is no better off than before. The second factor for your arguments is the coherence between your premises and your conclusions. Your argument is only as strong as what your premises are justifying, and if your conclusion seems like it was pulled out of thin air, then you likely have a weak argument. You can picture this by imagining the argument as a math problem. If you add up all of your premises, your conclusion is what you get for a sum. If your sum doesn't equal what it should, then you don't have a very good argument. So let's look at an example of an argument. Here we have an argument for what makes up an argument. Premise 1 is, arguments contain premises. Premise 2 is, arguments contain a conclusion. 3 is, arguments aim to show or prove a point. And for our conclusion we have, an argument is a combination of premises and a conclusion aiming to prove a statement. Using the factors we established before, we can check the strength of this argument. The premises all state true facts, and all state facts that are relative to the conclusion. As well, we can see that the conclusion does flow from the premises without any leaps needing to be made. So the argument passes all the tests, and we can say that this is a strong argument. And that's it! Now you know what an argument is. Hopefully next time somebody accuses you of being argumentative, you'll be able to teach them something. Feel free to use an argument to do it. Oh, and one more thing. In this video, I've intentionally used a fallacy in my reasoning. Did you catch it? If not, see if you can. Don't know what a fallacy is? Make sure you check back to find out. Tune in next time for more facts, theories, and philosophy. This has been PH Times. Okay, so we want to kind of think of an argument as a verbal equation, like math, but without numbers. So if you look at the slide here, uh, you can see that this is similar to a, um, an equation, uh, but without numbers. Instead of numbers, we have words. Um, so the same way that many numbers can equal one sum, um, so like 4 plus 1 can equal 5, or 5 plus 0 can equal 5, or 2 plus 3 can equal 5, um, many premises can equal one conclusion. And also, just as we can plug in one wrong number, that creates a wrong answer. So if we were to say, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 5, then that would create a wrong answer. We can have one wrong premise that creates a wrong conclusion. For example, if we said the law allows the sale of a heroin, instead of saying the law prohibits the sale of heroin, then that would make our conclusion incorrect. So the only real difference between uh, math problems and uh, or math equations in terms of their format and their setup and verbal equations is that verbal arguments are often more complex and difficult to test than math problems because math problems you know they're either right or wrong right and, and generally all the pieces are kind of laid out and are evident for you but arguments can be a little bit more tricky than that have um, premises that aren't really even spoken um, have so a ton of premises uh, have ones that you need to disregard so it can get a little tricky but that's the basic idea of uh, what an argument is, the terms that you'll need to know for the different components of an argument, and kind of how we want to view them for our purposes. Okay, for lecture activity one, I'd like for you to try writing a verbal argument as a math equation with two premises and one conclusion. So you can refer to the previous slide if you would like um, in terms of how to kind of format that, but you should have premise one and then your statement plus premise two and then another statement and then you draw your line and under that is your conclusion um, and so your two premises together that line of reasoning should uh, support the conclusion that you have written there so go ahead and give it a shot you can make up an argument uh, you can um, use ones that you've heard before however you want to go about it but that's for lecture activity one Okay, so you already watched a video clip embedded in this uh, lecture video about the different parts of an argument and the terminology for understanding those parts. But let's go ahead and just kind of recap that. So um, you're going to really be focusing on either uh, premises or conclusions as you're uh, evaluating arguments. And so a set of claims or statements is ultimately what makes up or comprises an argument. One of the claims is going to be singled out and called the conclusion. This is going to be your final judgment. 
And then the other uh, claims or statements are called the premises. And these are kind of the points that you're making to support your conclusion or to formulate your argument uh, so that it leads to the judgment or the conclusion. And then the premises are intended as offering reasons to believe or accept the conclusion. So that's what I'm saying. They're your points. They're offering the reasons to believe or accept the conclusion. So when you are evaluating arguments, there's some principles that you should do uh, use. The first thing is to look at the premises and determine if they are either true or false, if they're correct or incorrect. So you want to look at each one individually. Um, so if one of the premises is that the law doesn't prohibit the sale of heroin, you would look at that premise and you'd say, okay, the law doesn't prohibit the sale of heroin. That is incorrect. That is false. The law does prohibit the sale of heroin. So you would then conclude that that premise, let's say it's premise one, premise one is false. The second thing that you want to do when you're evaluating arguments is check that the reasoning that links the uh, premises to the conclusion is either valid or invalid. In other words, the, the um, reasoning must follow a logical thought process to arrive at the conclusion. And then the third thing you want to do is make sure that the correct, prem that correct premises, so after you've evaluated the premises to make sure they're correct, that if they are correct, those correct premises um, plus valid reasoning that you can put premise one and premise two together uh, equal a sound argument, so equal a sound conclusion. And it's important to note that either an incorrect premise or invalid reasoning will render an argument unsound. So just like how we can have accurate numbers but make an error in calculation, we can have accurate premises but error in, in, in reasoning. So I teach statistics and it can get to be pretty um, complex in terms of solving formulas. And I see this all the time. People will have just very basic math formulas, you know, 2 plus 3. And instead of writing that it equals 5, they're just focused on all these moving parts to the formula. So they, they'll they just accidentally write 2 plus 3 equals 4, right? Um, and so this can happen in an argument as well, that we can have the formula is set up correctly. We can have correct premises, but instead of getting a 5, which is the right conclusion, we get a 4 just by a, a simple error. Um, and generally when this happens, it's due to what we call reckless reasoning, which is basically the idea that the reasoning you're using to link your premises to together to support the conclusion is invalid. The glue that you're using to link the premises together is just not working. For example, um, there, here's an example of reckless reasoning. There was, this is true, there was a worker that was fired from his job from being late. And um, he wanted to say that this was unlawful termination, so he went to court. And in court, his uh, attorney argued that the employer was at fault for the employee being late because the employer didn't require the employee to wear a watch. So there's things that are true, right? The employee was fired for being late. The employer didn't require the employee to, to wear a watch. But to say that those two things together equal that it's the employer's fault, that's reckless reasoning. That is um, putting or looking at two premises and linking them together to draw a conclusion that's just not valid. So we have to pay attention to our reasoning as well as are these premise, uh, premises true or false and do they equal the conclusion. So it's important also just to kind of keep in mind as a critical thinker that if you think your first impressions are correct without question, then you are more likely to error an argument. So just kind of accepting your first impressions or your first judgments without kind of looking at them deeply, this leaves you open to self-deception and manipulation by others. Um, so if you just kind of blindly accept what anyone tells you, um, or you just uh, have an opinion and you just go with it without researching it or looking for evidence or looking at the soundness of the argument, then you're more easily uh, taken advantage of, right? And then also we need to think critically, tentatively, and compare with other ideas before we kind of make these conclusions or form judgments. Okay, so for lecture activity two, I'd like for you to um, just try evaluating an argument. So this is your first time doing it um, for some of us, and it can be a little bit confusing. So uh, we're just going to try and, and see how it feels and see how we do. Um, and then many of us will improve from this point. So um, it's not about getting it right or wrong, really. It's just about kind of try, trying it to see where you're at right now. So I want you to look at uh, the slide, 
And then on your document for lecture activity two, I'd like you to read premise one, which says all musicians can read music. And so you're going to write down on your document premise one, and then you're going to put either true or false. So is that a true or false statement? All musicians can read music. And then um, on your document for lecture activity two, you're going to write number two, John is a musician. And we're going to go ahead and just assume that that premise is true. So you can just write two is true. And then we're going to uh, write down on our lecture activity document conclusion. And the conclusion here is, therefore, John can read music. So if you look at premise one, and you're going to determine if it's correct or incorrect, plus premise two, which we're saying is correct, does do those two things together equal that conclusion, and is that conclusion correct? So when you're writing down for the conclusion uh, on your lecture activity document, what you're writing down is either this, this argument is valid or invalid. So if you think that premise one plus premise two equals a valid conclusion that therefore John can read music, you're going to write conclusion is valid. If you think that premise one plus premise two does not equal a valid conclusion, then you would write conclusion invalid. And remember that for a argument to be valid, both premises must be true. So if one of those premises isn't true, then that makes your conclusion invalid. Okay, so try that for lecture activity two. So um, evaluating arguments is pretty difficult uh, for a lot of my students. So we're going to watch a video now that hopefully will help us um, to learn kind of tricks in terms of um, being able to identify premises and conclusions from arguments because you're going to be doing that a lot in this class in homework, act uh, homework assignments, activities, and on exams. So check out this video. Argument analysis would be a lot easier if people gave their arguments in standard form, with the premises and conclusions flagged in an obvious way. But people don't usually talk this way or write this way. Sometimes the conclusion of an argument is obvious, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the conclusion is buried or implicit, and we have to reconstruct the argument based on what's given. And it's not always obvious how to do this. In this tutorial, we're going to look at some principles that will help us identify premises and conclusions and put natural language arguments in, in standard form. This is a very important critical thinking skill in, in general, but it's also one that is required to answer many questions on the LSAT. Here's an argument. Abortion is wrong because all human life is sacred. Question. Which is the conclusion? Abortion is wrong or all human life is sacred? For most of us, the answer is clear. Abortion is wrong is the conclusion, and all human life is sacred is the premise. Now, how do we know this? Well, two things are going on. First, we are consciously, intentionally reading for the argument. And when we do this, we're asking ourselves, what claim are we being asked to believe or accept? What other claims are being offered as reasons to accept that claim? Second, we recognize the logical significance of that word because. Because is what we call an indicator word, a word that indicates the logical relationship of claims that come before or after it. In this case, it indicates that the claim following it is being offered as a reason to accept the claim before it. So rewriting this argument in standard form, it looks like this. All human life is sacred, therefore abortion is wrong. At this point, we could start talking about whether this is a good argument or not. That's not really the point of this tutorial. Right now, we're more concerned with identifying premises and conclusions and getting the logical structure of an argument right. Here are some key words or phrases that indicate a conclusion. Therefore, so, hence, thus, it follows that, as a result, consequently, and of course, there are others. The argument on the right gives an example using so. It's flu season and you work with kids, so you should get a flu shot. Now, keywords like this make it much easier to identify conclusions, but not all arguments have keywords that flag it. Some arguments have no indicator words of any kind. In these cases, you have to rely on your ability to analyze context and read for the argument. Here's a more complex argument that illustrates this point. We must reduce the amount of money we spend on space exploration. Right now, the enemy is launching a massive military buildup, and we need the additional money to purchase military equipment. 
to match the anticipated increase in the enemy's strength. Notice that there are no indicator words that might help us flag the conclusion. So, which claim is the conclusion of this argument? Is it, we must reduce the amount of money we spend on space exploration? Is it, the enemy is launching a massive military buildup? Or is it, we need the additional money to purchase military equipment to match the anticipated increase in the enemy's strength? You can pause the video now if you want a second to think about this. Okay, the answer is one. We must reduce the amount of money we spend on space exploration. Most people can see this just by looking at the argument for a few seconds. But from experience, I know that some people have a much harder time seeing logical relationships like this. If it's not obvious to you, the way to work the problem is this. For each claim asserted in the argument, you have to ask yourself, is this the main point that the arguer is trying to convey? Or is this a claim that's being offered as, as a reason to believe another claim? If it's being offered as a reason to believe another claim, then it's functioning as a premise. If it's expressing the main point of the argument, but the argument is trying to persuade you to accept, then it's the conclusion. Now, there are words and phrases that indicate premises, too. Here are a few. Since, if, because, from which it follows, for these reasons, and of course, there are others as well. Here's an example on the right that uses since. John will probably receive the next promotion since he's been here the longest. Since is used to indicate that John's being here the longest is a reason for thinking that he'll probably receive the next promotion. So, let's summarize. Arguments in natural language usually aren't presented in standard form, so we need to know how to extract the logical structure from the language that's given. To do this, we look at each of the claims in the argument and we ask ourselves, is this the main point that the arguer is trying to convey, or is this being offered as a reason to accept some other claim? The claim that expresses the main point is the conclusion. The claims that are functioning as reasons to accept the main point are the premises. And finally, premises and conclusions are often flagged by the presence of an indicator word. And paying attention to indicator words can really help to simplify the task of reconstructing an argument. Okay, so to simplify the guidelines of evaluating arguments further, I want you to really answer these two questions that you see on the slide. Once you've identified your premises and your conclusion, then you're going to go through and you're going to look at each premise individually, and you're going to say, is premise one true or false? Is premise two true or false? And there could be three, four, five, six premises. It just depends on the argument. But you go through each one to make sure they're true. If any of them are not true, then your argument is invalid, or sometimes it's called unsound. Okay, so first, are the premises true? If the answer is yes, we can keep evaluating the argument. If the answer is no, game over. And then the second thing we want to do if the premises are true is ask, does the reasoning of, of these premises being linked together, does the reasoning lead to a valid conclusion? If the answer is yes, then we have a valid argument. If the answer is no, then we do not have a valid argument. So these are really the two questions that you're asking yourself as you're evaluating arguments. Um, so to hopefully cement this idea into our brains even further, let's watch another clip on how to successfully evaluate arguments. My name is Julianne Chung, and I'm a graduate student at Yale University. Today, I am going to talk about truth and validity. There are many different good qualities that arguments can have. For example, they can be clear, they can be interesting, they can be persuasive, and so on. In this video, however, we are going to discuss just two good qualities that arguments can have that are particularly important for determining whether we should accept their conclusions. The first is this, the premises of an argument may be true, that is, they may be in agreement with the facts. In philosophy, truth and falsity are held to be properties of statements, but not arguments. Second, an argument may be valid. An argument is valid when its conclusion follows logically from its premises. In other words, an argument is valid just in case the truth of its premises guarantees the truth of its conclusion. 
In philosophy, validity and invalidity are held to be properties of arguments, but not statements. To see the difference between these properties, it will be helpful to look at some examples, all of which involve my good friend Julia's dog, Split. This is an example of an argument that has true premises and is valid. Premise 1. All Australian shepherds are dogs. Premise 2. Split is an Australian shepherd. Conclusion. Therefore, Split is a dog. In this argument, not only are the premises true, but the conclusion follows logically from them. Next is an example of an argument that has true premises, but is not valid. Premise 1. All dogs are animals. Premise 2. All cats are animals. Conclusion. Therefore, all cats are dogs. Here, the premises are obviously true, but the conclusion does not follow logically from them. Of course, this argument is clearly unacceptable because its conclusion is obviously false. However, sometimes arguments can have true premises as well as true conclusions, but still be invalid because the conclusions do not follow logically from them. Here is an example of such a case. Premise 1. All dogs are animals. Premise 2. All Australian shepherds are animals. Conclusion. Therefore, all Australian shepherds are dogs. Because of this, it is important that we are careful to ensure that the conclusion really does follow from the premises under consideration when we are evaluating an argument. We are now going to look at an argument with at least one false premise that is valid. Premise 1. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Premise 2. Split is an old dog. Conclusion. Therefore, you can't teach Split new tricks. Here, the first premise is false, but the reasoning is valid because the conclusion follows logically from the premises. Notice, too, that just as in the last example, the conclusion of this argument may happen to be true, although the argument does not establish that it is. All right, just one more example. This argument has at least one false premise and is invalid. Premise 1. I like Split. Premise 2. Training dogs is easy. Conclusion, therefore, I'll win a lot of awards for teaching Split how to roll over. In this example, not only is premise 2 false, but the conclusion does not follow logically from the premises. You have probably already noticed that truth and falsity, as well as validity and invalidity, can appear in various combinations in an argument, giving rise to four possibilities. Let's take a moment to review them together. Possibility 1. We may have our facts right, our premises are true, and we may use them properly. Our reasoning is valid. Possibility two, we may have our facts right, our premises are true, and we may use them improperly. Our reasoning is invalid. Possibility three, we may have our facts wrong, some of our premises are false, and we may use them properly. Our reasoning is valid. And finally, possibility four, we may have our facts wrong, some of our premises are false, and we may use them improperly. Our reasoning is invalid. When we are evaluating an argument, we should only accept its conclusions if the first possibility obtains. Philosophers call such arguments sound arguments. Because of this, you might be wondering why we should be at all interested in arguments that are valid, but whose premises are false. One answer is that we are often not in a position to know whether our premises are true. But being able to validly infer the conclusions that would follow from such premises if they were true sometimes enables us to judge whether they are true. This is because validly inferring a conclusion that we know to be false from a given set of premises will tell us that one of our premises must be false too. After all, a false conclusion cannot validly be deduced from true premises. Consider the following example. Say that John calls his boss at work one day and tells her that he is in bed with a terrible case of the flu. His boss, it seems, could use that information to construct the following argument. Premise 1. John is in bed with a terrible case of the flu. Premise 2. If John is in bed with a terrible case of the flu, then he is not bowling. Conclusion. Therefore, John is not bowling. This argument is valid. Its conclusion follows logically from its premises. So, if John's boss were to see him bowling, what could she conclude? Premise 2 seems untouched by this bit of evidence. 
Premise one, however, is in danger. She could conclude that John is not in bed with a terrible case of the flu. It seems he lied. This is, of course, just a very simple example. That said, hopefully it suffices to show that we often use reasoning like this to figure out whether claims are true or false. Thus it is indeed often very useful for us to know whether an argument is valid, even if we don't know whether its premises are true. For more information about truth, validity, and soundness, I highly recommend checking out Paul's video on validity and Aaron's video on soundness. So, unfortunately, not all arguments are as clear as the examples we've been using. Not all arguments are one premise plus the second premise equals this conclusion. Um, so there's lots of ways that arguments can be more difficult than the ones we've been looking at. One of the ways is when an argument is longer than a paragraph, or if a person's saying their argument to you and they're just talking and talking and talking. Uh, so when an argument is, is really long, longer than a paragraph, for example, we want to summarize that argument um, before asking questions, but be careful to summarize it accurately. And then the second thing that can make arguments difficult to evaluate is um, if we're uncertain which st uh, statements are the premise and which statement is the conclusion. So to kind of help you with that, you want to ask yourself, what is the idea that they're trying to get me to accept? And that's going to be your conclusion. You can also look out for words like therefore, furthermore, um, that kind of indicate that this is the end of their um, argument, the end of their points, which would imply that they're at their conclusion. And then we also want to ask ourselves what reasons are offered as support for this idea, for this conclusion. And the answer to that is going to be the premises. And then another thing that makes arguments difficult to evaluate is if an argument contains more than two premises, which they often do. And so in that case, we want to ask and get answers for questions about each premise. We want to eliminate any irrelevant premises. Um, decide if the conclusion follows a logical thought process, uh, especially with the remaining premises. So if we have to eliminate any premises, then uh, with the ones that we have left, do these together link to a valid conclusion? And then let's say you're kind of playing moderator and you're uh, looking at two sides of an argument. So you're evaluating opposing arguments. And in this particular case, neither one of the arguments are particularly persuasive. It's not clear who is having a stronger or more valid argument. Um, and so in cases like this, you can look for what's called a third alternative. Um, and a third alternative is kind of a compromise between the two sides or an alternative uh, conclusion or answer or solution to a problem. So for example, um, some, some schools actually have had this argument, which is, should we display the Ten Commandments in school to teach kids morals? And some people say no, it gives preferential treatments to Christians and Jewish people. Um, and so a third alternative is often proposed in these arguments, which is to display all religious um, commandments or, or tenets um, and secular lists of moral values as well so that no one is being excluded. And then another thing that can make arguments really difficult to evaluate is when they have what are called hidden premises. And hidden premises are implied ideas that when are, um, they are inaccurate, they, they corrupt the argument. Um, but they are not stated. They're not specifically stated. They are part of the argument, but they're not spoken of. They're just in there. So they're an implication uh, that the person is making without really even saying it. And they're tricky and they're sneaky and we have to identify them um, if they exist before proceeding with our evaluation. Now they're not in every argument, but we got to look out for them. And if they are in an argument, we have to identify it. So we're going to watch a quick uh, video clip on hidden premises versus stated premises. And then we'll um, try kind of um, some exercises to help us figure out how to identify these hidden premises. Hidden peace, implied conclusions and unstated assumptions. You know that arguments have three key pieces. One, a conclusion. Two, one or more premises. And three, a connection between the premises and the conclusion. Unfortunately, 
people do not always explain themselves very well. And one or more of these three pieces may be unclear or even left out entirely. In this module, you will learn about three hidden or missing pieces you should watch for when evaluating or making an argument. One, implied conclusions. Two, unstated premises. And three, missing connections. Implied conclusions. As a critical thinker, your task would be much easier if anytime someone made an argument, they made sure to clearly and carefully state their conclusion. It would be great if every conclusion began with, therefore, I conclude that, unfortunately, this simply isn't the way things work. People often fail to identify their ultimate point when making an argument. Arguments with unstated conclusions force the listener or reader to figure out what the conclusion was. Imagine you and a friend are discussing going to college. You go back and forth talking about what experience you'd have, how much it would cost, and what you want to major in. Eventually, your friend says, the whole point of going to college is to get a job, and there aren't any jobs in history or literature or stuff like that. So what's his conclusion? It seems like he's implying that you shouldn't major in one of those areas because you wouldn't be able to get a job. But that conclusion is only implied. He hasn't actually stated it, and thus he hasn't completed his argument. Leaving a conclusion unstated makes it harder on people to analyze your argument. Essentially, you're making them do the work of figuring out what you're trying to really say. But it's also risky. If you leave it up to others to draw their own conclusion, sometimes they'll come to a conclusion you did not intend. It is not always obvious to the listener or reader what conclusion is being implied. For example, pretend you're having a debate with someone about what kinds of things should be taught in schools. You claim, schools need to teach the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Your classmate counters, no way. Schools also should teach kids how to be good people. They need to help them develop values. Oh, come on, you respond. If schools are supposed to teach values, who gets to decide which values? So what is your conclusion? Think back through the argument so far. You said schools need to teach the basics. Your friend said they also need to teach values. And then you replied with a question, what values? With your final statement, did you mean to conclude that schools should not teach values? They should only teach the basics? Or is your conclusion that schools should teach values but they need to hire good teachers who can pick the right values? Or, alternatively, do you conclude that while schools should teach values, they should let parents pick which ones? If you don't actually finish your argument by offering a specific conclusion, then you leave it up to someone else to infer your unstated conclusion. If they guess the right conclusion, there's no harm done. But the conclusion they infer may not be the one you meant to offer. Then, you got a misunderstanding. Unstated premises. While implied conclusions are problematic, unstated premises are even more common. Sometimes people fail to state a premise because it seems so obvious or straightforward that they simply forget to say it out loud or put it in writing. Imagine that you and a friend are going to a concert. When you get to the parking lot, you notice a sign that says, must be 18 or older for this concert. Suddenly, you realize that you left your ID at home. Out loud, you exclaim, oh no, you have to be at least 18 to get in. We have to drive back home and we'll be late for the concert. Your friend is confused. Why are we going to be late? We're already in the parking lot and we're on time. What your friend is missing, the premise that you failed to state, is that one, you will need to show ID to prove that you're at least 18, 
and two, you left your ID at home. The first unstated premise, that you will have to show ID, may be something you simply assumed everyone knows. The second, that you left your ID at home, is something you just thought about, and so you may have forgotten that you hadn't told your friend yet. Having those pieces of information is important for your friend to be able to make sense of your conclusion. Complex arguments involve a lot of different claims and pieces, and people often forget to include all of the specific claims or premises that build up to their conclusion. Sometimes we assume that details are obvious or known to everyone, such as the assumption that you must show ID to prove your age. So we leave them out. Assuming these details are obvious or known to everyone can be reasonable, but not always. The danger to making good arguments is that the premises that we leave out or remain unstated can be unjustified or unwarranted. For an unstated factual premise, how are you going to tell whether it's true or not if you don't know it's there? And if the unstated premise is an opinion, you don't have a chance to determine how strong or weak it is. It's much more of a challenge to think critically about an argument when the premises are not stated. Consider the following statement made by a professor. Allowing a student to take an exam at a later date would give them more time than other students to prepare for the exam. Therefore, I do not allow any makeup exams under any circumstances. What premise is missing from this argument? What has the professor assumed? The unstated premise in this case is that it's unfair to allow a student to have more preparation time than others have. This may seem like a reasonable assumption, but is it? Can you think of any possible ways to refute this premise and thus undermine the argument? What about if a student gets in a car accident and has to spend the day of the exam in the hospital? Is it fair for that student to get a failing grade on the exam? Remember that the objective of an argument is to offer the best possible answer or solution to a question or problem. The goal of critical thinking is to analyze arguments to determine whether they're strong or weak. And if your analysis leads you to decide that an argument is weak or false, critical thinking will help you find ways to improve the argument. We can only do that if we have all the premises in front of us, if we know each step in the argument, so that we can evaluate each premise and provide alternative premises, if necessary. And much like implied conclusions, if you do not clearly state all premises, then you are at the mercy of others who will fill in the blanks for you, and they may not offer the premises you intended. Missing Connections the final problem that can make it difficult to evaluate an argument is a missing connection between the premises and conclusion. Identifying connections is part of correctly identifying premises and conclusions. Remember that premises provide the support for a conclusion. They are the reasons for believing assumptions are connected to a conclusion in a certain way. When someone says x plus y and therefore z, we know that X and Y are premises that cause Z to be the conclusion. But the connection between different claims in an argument is not always obvious. So much so that it can be hard to tell which statement is the premise and which is the conclusion. Imagine you're researching internet use and you come across the following statement. It used to be that children spent most of their time playing outside. I know when I was a kid, my parents always made sure I was out of the house, getting to know all the neighborhood kids. Now, children today spend so much more time inside on their computers online all the time. Kids today are much more lonely, and they don't know how to make friends. My kids hardly talk about any of their classmates, and they don't know anyone in the neighborhood. It is clear that there are two main claims here. One, that kids are spending more time online, and by implication, less time outside, and two, that kids are lonelier and don't have any friends. But which of these claims is the premise 
and which is the conclusion? Is the argument meant to be that because kids spend more time inside and online, they have trouble making friends in real life and thus are lonely? Or is the argument that because kids have trouble making friends, they then spend more time inside and online? These are two very different arguments about what is wrong with children's lives today, and they would lead to very different proposals on what to do about the situation. When you engage in critical thinking, you must take the time to carefully evaluate an argument, identifying all premises, conclusions, and the relationship between them. You must be alert for unclear and missing pieces. And if you believe something is missing, you have to ask questions. What is the real conclusion here? What is being assumed, and is that assumption valid? What claim is being defended, and what is the support for that claim? As you make your own arguments, you should make sure to clearly and carefully state each piece of your argument, leaving nothing for others to assume on their own. When arguments are carefully constructed, they're easier to evaluate, and thus easier to either accept, reject, or improve, and to put into action. Okay, so let's say that someone makes this argument about a couple. They should have never married because they felt no strong physical attraction to each other during courtship. So when we look at this argument, we want to uh, break it down into a verbal equation. So we want to identify the premises and the conclusions, and we want to watch out for any hidden premises. So I will tell you that in this argument, there is in fact a hidden premise. So let's start by um, breaking down our verbal equation. So we can say that the stated premise is they felt no strong physical attraction to each other, and the conclusion is that they should never have married. All of this was uh, visible, written on the slide, you could see it, it was part of the argument. But there's also something implied here, something that wasn't directly said. And this is what's going to constitute our hidden premise. So they felt no strong physical attraction to each other, therefore they shouldn't have never married, as if that's the only reason being offered for why these this couple shouldn't have married. So what's not being said, but what is implied, is the hidden premise. And the hidden premise here, which I've worded this way, but of course since it's not stated, it's implied, it's not written, so you kind of uh, would write it in your own words, um, and so it, might, it, it doesn't have to look exactly like mine, for example. But anyways, uh, so the hidden premise here is that strong physical attraction is the best or perhaps only meaningful basis for marriage. Um, so that's, again, not stated, but it's definitely implied in the argument. Okay, so let's try another one. So our first stated premise is that artificial lighting was used when the Apollo pictures were taken. And the conclusion is that the Apollo pictures were taken in a studio on Earth. So there is a premise that is missing. It's not being said, but it's definitely implied in order to link it with the other premise and draw the conclusion that the Apollo pictures were taken in a studio on Earth. So what I'd like for you to do for lecture activity number three is go ahead and write another verbal equation. So you're going to have premise one and you're going to write that out. And I'd also like for you to indicate that this is the stated premise. So you could put premise one, stated premise, and then write artificial lighting was used when the Apollo pictures were hidden. Um, I'm sorry, were taken. And then under that, you're going to write you're going to write the plus sign, and then premise two, and next to premise two, and in this case, maybe in parentheses, you can write hidden premise, and then you're going to write what you think the hidden premise is, and then draw a line under that and write conclusion, and then write the Apollo pictures were taken in a studio on Earth. So for lecture activity three, I'd like for you to try to. Um, identify what the hidden premise is within this argument and write the whole argument as a verbal equation, being sure to identify which premises are stated and which premise is uh, hidden. Okay, so I would say that the hidden premise for this one is that artificial lighting is only available in a studio on Earth. Um, of course, that could be worded differently, but that's the main idea. Okay, so that is it for this chapter. 
go ahead and um, submit your lecture activities and don't forget to do the associated assignments uh, with this week's module and we will be seeing you on the next lecture video. Have a good day.